Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for another Australian Fluid Mechanics Seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Maziar AC from University of Colorado. Uh, Maziar did his PhD at University of Maryland. He was postdoc at Brown University for a while, and then he started as a senior software engineer at NVIDIA in Silicon Valley. And his main research interest is in machine learning, deep learning, and data-driven scientific computing. And he, today, he's going to give us a talk on hidden physics models. With this, I'm handing it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation, actually. Uh, yes, so today I'm going to be talking about hidden physics models. And it's a work at the intersection of probabilistic machine learning, deep learning, and data-driven scientific computing. Uh, everything started with this project. It's a project supported by DARPA. And the idea is you want to design super cavitating hydrofoils in such a way that enable uh, a marine vessel to go as fast as possible. Basically, it's going to break the water. It's going to create vapor around it. And then uh, because of the lift forces, the vessel is gonna lift itself up, and then we can say that it's flying in air rather than water because of the vapor around the super cavitating hydrofoil. This is external flow, and uh, we ended uh, with another work. And these topics, I'm gonna go through the details of the math and uh, methodology behind it. But we ended with internal flow. This is the aneurysm of a real patient. This is the aneurysm behind the left eye of a patient. Uh, we are trying to simulate what happens if you do 4D MRI or CT scan. What type of data you would have? The type of data that you would have would be uh, the concentration, which is gonna be a value from zero to one of the dye that is injected in that patient's artery. This is qualitative. It's gonna tell the doctor that there is an aneurysm, but it's not gonna tell the doctor how severe that aneurysm is. It's very qualitative. The idea is that if you assume that Navier-Stokes equations are correct, can you back calculate the velocity field and the pressure? And using the velocity field and the pressure, you can compute the shear stress on the wall of the aneurysm and give the doctor more information of how severe that aneurysm is. Do they need to perform any surgeries or no? So that's the big picture. Uh, what am I not going to be talking about is about uh, image classification. I'm not going to be talking about languages or natural language processing or adversarial neural networks, generative adversarial neural networks. But why am I including this slide? The idea is that even in our images or in our sentences, there is physics. And a machine learning framework is not going to be successful if it's not using that underlying assumptions. For instance, if you take this airplane, you shift it to the right, shift it to the left, up or down, the class is still gonna be an airplane. So it shouldn't change. And one reason convolutions are successful is because they respect those types of invariances. For sentences, Maybe the sequential nature of the words following each other is something that you can build upon. And that's the type of physics that uh, a recurrent neural network or an, an LSTM or a transformer model is going to leverage. Similar thing for high dimensional data of images. So these are high dimensional because every single pixel is a dimension. And the idea of a GANS is to 
try to learn the underlying distribution. In uh, deep learning and machine learning, they call this inductive bias of their framework. In scientific computing, we call it physics inform or physics of the problem. It's just a different name for the same concept. The cool thing about the previous slide is that you have plenty of data. You have plenty of images on the internet. You have plenty of text on the internet. You have the entire internet in front of you. And if you have big data, you can actually learn your physics. You don't need to make too much assumptions about your model. In scientific computing, we don't have that much data. And there is a reason for it. The reason is if you want to build this vessel, and this is actually what we were proposing back then to DARPA, if you want to design this, you need to collect data. It's a chicken and egg problem. You need to first build it if you want to collect data, put it in water and collect real data around the behavior of that vessel. But we know that that's gonna be really costly. The other alternative is uh, to do simulations and try to incorporate physics in your machine learning framework in an implicit fashion. So you do a lot of simulations. You hope that the simulation or the simulated environment is a good proxy for the real world. And then you train a physics uninformed machine learning or deep learning framework on that data that is generated from simulations. And then hope that if you take that trained model and take it to real data, that's gonna work. And that's called domain adaptation in uh, machine learning jargons or transfer learning, etc. But even collecting simulated data for a problem as complex as supercapitating hydrofoils is not easy. It's going to take six hours to give you every single data. But let's assume that we want to do that and we want to be as data efficient as possible with our simulations. So we take that supercapitating hydrofoil, we design it, we parameterize it, a 2D cross section of that 3D geometry is this geometry that you see on the right. You can parameterize it with splines. For instance, you can parameterize it with 16 variables, going left, right, left, up or down for a bunch of points. And then the idea is that you're gonna do your simulation. Given that geometry, solve your Navier-Stokes equations using your simulator, compute the lift over drag, and then the idea is you want to maximize lift over drag because you want this vessel to fly in water to lift itself up. So that's the type of data that we're gonna have. And we said we're gonna start with something that is data efficient, with Gaussian processes. Uh, like any other machine learning framework, you're gonna have four components, data, prior training and prediction. The data is in the form of input output, input geometry, output, lift over drag. If you put everything in vector notation, you get y is equal to f of x plus epsilon. We can think of xi as one geometry you do your simulation and then you get the corresponding yi, which could be a noisy estimate of the actual reality. And then you are collecting a lot of data or some data. And these are your data. Geometry, lift over drag. The problem is that we don't know this f. If we knew f, the problem would have been solved. So there is nothing to worry about. This is actually our simulator that we are trying to regress and build a surrogate for. 
So F, you have a choice. This is a choice that we make. It's a prior. It's an assumption that we make. We say that it's a Gaussian process with some mean and some covariance function. This is just a fancy notation for what I'm writing here. So this is a shortcut notation for uh, f of x and f of x prime. So you take two points in your space, you evaluate your function at those two points, you assume that they are normally distributed with some mean zero and some covariance. And you have k of x, x, k of x, x prime, k of x prime, x prime, etc. cetera. But uh, you say f, you just keep the red parts of this notation. One assumption about k, your covariance function, could be this assumption. So you have a lot of options here. You can have matern kernels. This is just a squared exponential kernel. You first square and then you take an exponential. And the assumption here is that if two points are really far apart from each other, then this negative sign with the help of the exponential is gonna set the covariance to go to zero. It means that they are not correlated that much. This is not a bad assumption for some problems, but it could be very bad for some other problems. But it's a choice that we make. For training, our data assumption was normal, the prior was normal, so we can say y is normally distributed with mean zero and a covariance matrix. Because it's a, now you have the likelihood, you have a distribution for your data, which is gonna give you a likelihood, and then you can do maximum likelihood estimation to adjust the parameters of your kernel. These are called hyperparameters. If you, there is an exponential term in the normal distribution. If you take a log, the log is gonna cancel the distribution. And in machine learning, you usually like to minimize rather than maximize. So you multiply by a negative sign and that's gonna give you this formula down here. So this is coming from normal distribution. So there is nothing complicated about this. But something cool happens. The first term is trying to fit the data. The second term is trying to regularize the kernel to come up with the model that is the simplest. And this is the idea of Occam's razor. So you're trying to find the simplest explanation for your data. And that's why Gaussian processes are data efficient. For prediction, somebody gives us a new geometry. We have two options. Actually, we have three options. Take the geometry, put it in actual experiments or in real water and collect and compute the lift over drag. The other option is call your simulator, which is gonna take six hours to give you the value of f of x prime. Or you can base, or you can condition on your data, on your training data. And we are gonna take that route. We are gonna take, we don't want to spend six hours, we, don't, we want to spend a fraction of a second to know the value of f of x prime for that geometry. Now you can condition on the data. Some people say you are making a mean zero assumption. Is that hurting you? Perhaps. But after you condition on your data, the mean is gonna become non-zero. So the mean is gonna get lifted up. So it's no more zero. And this is actually the exact formula for your mean. So many people like to think of Gaussian processes as processes, as random processes. But throughout this, walk, throughout this talk, I want you to think of it as function approximators. So you have a function, you're approximating it. And actually it's, if you expand this in terms of the data, this is just gonna be an RBF, a radial basis function expansion. So actually you're doing expansion in terms of functions. And that's why K matters. It's like G 
choosing a Fourier basis for your domain or choosing sines and cosines or using hat functions, etc. K has the same similar role, this prior that you choose. But the cool thing about Gaussian processes is that it's gonna give you some variance that we are gonna build upon to optimize the geometry. So let's see how we're gonna use the uncertainty to do Bayesian optimization. This blue curve, we don't see it. It's a black box function, so we don't know that. And by black box, I mean you can only see examples of that function. You see that function through data, through samples. If we, if we knew this blue curve, the problem would be solved and there is nothing to worry about. So we don't see the blue curve and we want to maximize it. And we want to be as data efficient as possible. We don't see the blue curve, but you can do a regression, Gaussian process regression. We can take the mean, add the two standard deviation. This is where the uncertainty is helping us. This is gonna give us an upper confidence bound. Now you have a function that you can evaluate wherever you want in your domain. You can think of X as the space of geometries, as the space, as the space of shapes and uh, the y axis as the lift over drag. And this is uh, what the algorithm is telling us. It's telling us, go ahead and sample next here. Go ahead and try out that geometry. You go ahead and try out that geometry, then uh, you keep doing the same thing. Go ahead and sample next here, you sample. Next, and after three iterations, you're already close to finding the maximum of that function. But the algorithm is not yet happy because it says, I see I have a huge uncertainty on the boundary of the domain. Let me go ahead and uh, deal with that problem, reduce the uncertainty there, explore again here, explore, exploit, explore, exploit, explore, exploit, and then you find the maximum. And you are being data efficient because you reduce the uncertainty to an acceptable uh, size in the portions of the functions that you don't really care about because the maximum is not gonna be there anyways. So there is no way, no, no reason to sample your geometry here or here or somewhere else. And that's how you're becoming more and more data efficient. We can extend that framework to multi-fidelity. And this is the idea that at that time, we had two solvers. One was taking six hours to give us data. The other one was a lower fidelity version of that model. It was potential flow. And it was taking six minutes. So it was much faster. And the idea is that you want to combine those two functions together, those two simulators together. So in this experiment, this is just for illustration purposes, you keep sampling from the low fidelity function and the high fidelity function is gonna get optimized, uh, is gonna get uh, updated. So you keep uh, sampling from the figure on the left and the figure on the right is getting updated. And it's because of some assumptions that you make. You make some assumptions that the high fidelity function is a linear combination of your low fidelity function from plus some correction term, which also is a function, it's a Gaussian process. And that simple assumption is giving you the correlation between two functions. And as soon as you know the correlation between two functions, observations of one function is gonna help observations of the other function. And that's exactly the idea behind multi-fidelity. So we applied that framework 
to a design that was already optimized using a genetic algorithm. This shape is already optimized. I was mentioning that in machine learning, we like to minimize. So rather than uh, maximizing lift over drag, here we are minimizing drag over lift. It's just a minor detail. But then the optimizer is gonna optimize and come up with a bet better geometry. So we did it not only for the hydrofoil, we did it for uh, every single component of that marine vessel. And each one had different physics and different simulators. So the framework is very general. So far, the physics was outside the machine learning framework. It was implicitly being on, incorporated through a surrogate into our machine learning framework. But here, we want to explicitly encode laws of physics because previously we were dealing with Navier-Stokes and the question is, can you actually incorporate Navier-Stokes in your Gaussian process somehow? And let's say this is your physics, Berger's equation, a simplified version of Navier-Stokes in 1D. You do uh, backward order, so un minus un minus one divided by delta t is the right hand side. You say un is a Gaussian process. You take that Gaussian process, push it through your differential equation, and then you can write down the correlation between yesterday and today. In uh, multi-fidelity jargons, un minus one is a low fidelity version of un. So yesterday is a low fidelity version of today. Today is a low fidelity version of tomorrow. So you can think of it that way as well. And the cool thing, and the only observation that you need for numerical Gaussian processes is that the derivative of a Gaussian process is another Gaussian process. The kernel is gonna change. Like here, the kernel we are taking is derivatives. And these derivatives, because you know your kernel, you can use symbolic differentiation. You can use mathematical metal to give you these derivatives, the exact form of these derivatives. And this is what we call a physics informed prior. What is the definition of a physics informed prior? Any samples that you generate from this Gaussian process regardless of the hyperparameters is gonna satisfy this equation. It's gonna satisfy your Berger's equation and your time-stepping scheme by construction. So any samples that you generate is gonna satisfy your equation. And that's what it means to be physics informed prior. And then you can use that to solve differential equations. For instance, if you have initial data, you have boundary data, you can train your model, predict into the future, generate artificial data, condition on your artificial data, predict for the next step and keep doing the same thing over and over again until you find a solution at the final time. And uh, some people say, what is this uncertainty? How do you interpret it? you can interpret it as a measure of the honesty of the method. Because the method is telling you that any of these samples from the posterior at the final time could be a solution to your differential equation. So this is an a posterior error estimate. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between Gaussian processes, numerical Gaussian processes, and Kalman filters. I don't think I have time to go through the details of the math, but if you write down the math for Kalman filters and numerical Gaussian processes, there is one-to-one -one correspondence. One of them is for finite dimensional systems, ODEs. The other one is for infinite dimensional systems because we are not discretizing the space. This is the space of functions that we're dealing with. So far we were solving forward problems. 
Can you use the same methodology to solve inverse problems? Let's say this is your equation. You have some parameters. These parameters do not have to show up linearly in your equation. For instance, you could have fractional derivatives, like you could have a fractional order here. And in this paper, we actually report results for fractional derivatives. So these parameters could show up in a nasty way and they don't have to be three of them. They could be as many as you want. You discretize in the space, in time, backward Euler. UN is a Gaussian process, push it through your neural network, push it through your differential equation, take your derivatives, the derivatives are gonna show up on your kernels. And now this is a physics informed prior, but something nice happened. The same maximum likelihood estimation that you were using for a simple Gaussian process to optimize over the hyperparameters of your kernel you can use the same framework, maximum likelihood estimation, to estimate lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. So your lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three parameters of your partial differential equation turn into parameters of your kernel or hyperparameters of your kernel. And then given two snapshots that are 0.4 apart, you can uh, estimate these parameters, even in the presence of noise. So this framework is data efficient because we are not taking the entire data set. We are taking only two snapshots from that data set that are delta t apart. This is data efficient for two reasons. One is Gaussian processes being data efficient, so that has nothing to do with us. The other one, is we are putting a lot of a structure on our priors. So not many functions are gonna happen. If you sample from this distribution, because of the physics, many of the samples are gonna be physically relevant. And that's why you are being data efficient. You can apply that to Navier-Stokes, flow past the cylinder. You can take two snapshots of your flow and then learn the Reynolds number. For instance, the Reynolds number could, could correspond to the shape of the object in front of you or some properties of your fluid. We applied that framework to experimental data and the framework failed because this is a very important point. If you make something physics informed, the physics matters. So your physics needs to be correct and it needs to match the data. So it's, it could be a blessing and it could be a curse at the same time, the physics. Why did the method fail? Because in that experimental setup, uh, we were trying to mimic uh, 2D flow past the cylinder. So it's a very thin uh, uh, space in the, three, in the third dimension. The other one is you're using soap film and there is no reason for soap film to be Newtonian. It could be non-Newtonian. And the other problem is the setup is upside down. So there is the effect of gravity that you need to incorporate in your physics. So the physics matters. I think I'm gonna skip this uh, part because it is not physics informed, but you can actually scale Gaussian processes to big data using the ideas of uh, numerical Gaussian processes because numerical Gaussian processes were generating artificial data from time step to time step. You can do the same thing here, but in terms of big picture and how it works, is you take a mini batch of your data from your big data set, you condition on it, you update your prior, which is gonna give you a posterior, and then your posterior is gonna be the prior for the next step. So it's the idea of posterior being prior for the next step. 
prior, posterior, prior, posterior, prior, posterior. As you see new data, you keep conditioning on it. And that way you don't have to look at your, the entirety of your data. You can look at your data in mini batches. The same way that you do, uh, you treat neural networks or you train neural networks. It's very similar. You can take your data in mini batches. So far we were talking about machine learning, probabilistic machine learning. Now let's go ahead towards the deep learning and neural networks. So I'm gonna approach neural networks from the perspective of, a, of scientific computing. We have data the same as before. And the idea is that what is this F? What, how do you model F? How do you model your function? If we were doing scientific computing, what would we do? We would choose a set of basis functions, HL, and then we would say F is a linear combination of a set of basis functions. Okay. And then uh, the problem is how do you choose your basis functions? In scientific computing, you would say, let's go with Fourier expansion or do spectral elements or do finite elements or hat basis functions, etc. For neural networks, you say, can we actually learn our basis functions on the fly? The idea is, uh, what if we do this? HL is a linear combination of a bunch of other basis functions. And if you forget about the nonlinearity for a second, then this is gonna end up being a linear model. So it's not gonna be able to model nonlinear functions because WL times WL minus one, you can just rename it, call it W tilde, and then your function is still linear. So this nonlinearity is there to help you model nonlinear functions. So you're learning your basis on the fly. Now the question is what is HL minus one? You just keep repeating the same pattern until you reach your input data or input uh, space. The rest of it is very similar to before. You write down your likelihood. Gaussian processes was all about the covariance. Neural networks is all about the mean of a normal distribution when you're doing regression. You have a normal distribution. You take the log, you multiply by negative sign. This is what we get. And this is exactly gonna give you the mean squared error. And prediction for neural networks is very easy. As soon as you learn your parameters, you can just take X star and push it through your neural network and it's gonna give you F of X star. So there is no conditioning. So you can compare these two frameworks together. Gaussian processes are non-parametric. What do I mean? You have to carry your data with you all the time. So you have to condition on your data. Neural networks, you are memorizing your data in your parameters. So you can throw away your data. So in that sense, it's parametric. Gaussian processes are not scalable to big data. Neural networks are scalable because you can do mini batch stochastic gradient descent to train them. You don't have to look at the entirety of your data in one pass because n could be in the order of millions, trillions and above. But you can look at it in terms of mini batches, 100 data at a time or 256 data points at a time. Gaussian processes quantify uncertainty. Neural networks don't. Gaussian processes balance the trade-off between data fit and model complexity because of that log determinant term. Neural network don't. These are the two extremes of this story. And there, is, there are ways to balance, uh, for instance, it's possible to make neural networks or Gaussian processes uh, adapt to big data. And we just saw an example of it you can make neural networks quantify uncertainty. 
using techniques such as dropout. And, uh, but these are the two extremes of this story. If you want to make neural networks or Gaussian processes more data efficient, you need to work harder. You need to write a little bit of more math. If you want to make neural networks quantify uncertainty or prevent them from overfitting, you need to work a little bit harder. You need to put some regularization terms. So in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be covering uh, these two arrows. There is one arrow, which is about data, and it goes from small data to medium-sized data to big data. And the other arrow goes in the opposite direction. It goes from physics-free, we don't make any assumptions about your data or your models. And then you have physics-based. The problems in this part of the regime, small data and physics based, let's call them forward problems. The problems that you have a little bit bigger size for your data set, and perhaps you know your physics up until some parameters. Let's call them inverse problems, data assimilation type of problems. And here on the other spectrum, where you have big data, Let's call them model discovery, because if you have enough data, you can actually learn your physics. For instance, if your data is in the form of text, textual data for languages, you have the entire internet in front of you, so there is no reason for you to make too strong assumptions about your physics. You can actually learn your physics from data. But it's very important that these two arrows are going in the opposite direction. You cannot learn your physics from small data. So you have to make some assumptions. And if you have big data, you can actually learn your physics. Let's start with forward problems. Here, you know your physics. This is your physics. And you know your physics up until the parameter. Actually, you know your parameters. So you know everything about your physics. What you're gonna do is you're gonna approximate U by a neural network. And the observation here is that the derivative of a neural network is another neural network. The computational graph, you're, you're still gonna have a computational graph. Perhaps you're gonna have different activation functions. Maybe if you have your activation function to be 10H, the activation function for the derivative of your function is gonna be one minus 10H squared because the derivative of 10H is one minus 10H squared. But whatever that you do, you still end up, you're still going to end up with a neural network with a computational graph. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to say we're going to take the derivative of u with respect to time, with respect to x, with respect to x twice, and return f. f and u, f is a neural network, u is a neural network, u is physics uninformed, f is physics informed. So that's the definition. The pair of these two functions, u and f, are gonna satisfy this equation. f is equal to ut plus u, ux, etc. By construction, to machine precision accuracy. Because here we are using automatic differentiation. These are a bunch of chain rules. In addition to memoization, that's gonna give you machine precision accuracy for your derivatives. So any pair of function, u and f, is gonna satisfy this equation, regardless of the choices of weights and biases. So you can initialize your weights and biases or choose them at random. It is still gonna satisfy this equation by construction. And that's what it means to be physics informed. How do you get the physics out? If you look at this equation, you are not interested in any F, you are interested in a particular F. Maybe you have a forcing term or your forcing term is zero. That's why you want to enforce F to be zero in a mean squared 
type of framework. And this is gonna give you a mean squared error loss. And then you can take the derivative of this loss function with respect to the gradients and do a stochastic gradient descent. And then you can solve Berger's equation. From the scientific computing perspective, I think nobody cares that you came up with a new framework to solve differential equations. There is already 50 years and beyond of finite elements, finite differences, finite volume, spectral elements, etc. So why would anybody care about a new way of solving PDs? But if you look at it from machine learning perspective, you are training a deep neural network that is heavily parameterized using only 100 data points. So that's the idea of data efficiency. So I guess this is slide I'm gonna skip. This one I'm gonna skip also because uh, it's about comparing neural networks to finite elements, finite difference and reduced order models. But the only difference here is that reduced order models is a generalization of finite element, finite volume, finite difference. When you are changing, you are choosing your basis functions in a smart way based on previous experience or previous time steps or similar geometries. You can do the same thing for neural networks. And that's gonna be called transfer learning. You train, you pre-train your neural network on a bunch of on a particular problem. And then you can take those parameters to warm start another round of training for another type of physics or another geometry. This is slide, I'm gonna skip the math, but uh, you can actually use neural networks and this framework, the exact same framework to solve high dimensional PDs like the type of PDs that are gonna show up when you want to write down the price of an option over 100 assets. Or the type of PDs that are gonna show up when you want to solve 100 dimensional hamilton jacobi Berman equation. These are for stochastic control. U here is the price of an option. U here is, the, is your value function. These are high, high dimensional, 100 dimensional. And we know that in high dimensions, there is no hope for finite differencing to work. Why is that? Because in one dimension, you can put a grid, you can put 10 points, for instance, in your grid. In 2D, it's gonna be 10 squared. In 3D, it's gonna be 10 cubed. And in 100 dimension, it's gonna be 10 to the power 100. And uh, this is simply not feasible. But the degrees of freedom of a neural network is not tied to any particular grid. The degree of freedom for a neural network is its weights and biases, which are not tied to any grid. Let's move forward to more interesting problems. This is actually my favorite one. When you solve inverse and data assimilation problems, here you know your physics and you know your physics up until some parameters. The exact same framework is gonna work. You, the neural network that takes time, X and Y as an input and it's outputting U, V and the pressure is physics uninformed, but the neural network that is gonna result from taking derivatives of U, P, and uh, V, they are gonna end up being physics informed. F, G, and H have the same parameters as U, V, and P. So they share parameters. And you can collect data behind the cylinder. These are your data. You can train using mean squared error loss. And then you can, uh, the same way that you're learning the parameters of your neural network, you're gonna end up learning the parameters of your equation. 
when we were writing this paper, we were trying to find lambda one and lambda two. And the method gave us that. It gave us lambda one and lambda two, even in the presence of noise. So this was good, but something interesting happened. We had absolutely no data on the pressure. But the pressure is popping out of nowhere, apparently. It is actually not out of nowhere. It's because of these equations getting enforced throughout the training. And the pressure is unique up until an additive constant. So these two figures, if you look at the color map, they are being shifted, but the constant doesn't really matter. So the neural network throughout the training is gonna land on some particular constant. We said, can we build upon that idea and uh, solve a more interesting problem perhaps? This is the artery on somebody's heart, on some patient, they have clearly stenosis here which could lead to heart attack. The pressure drop is very informative for the doctor about the severity of that uh, stenosis and should they do any surgery or not. We know the, the Navier-Stokes equations and at that time we said, what is our data? How about injected particles? We injected particles, the method is working, it is nice, but then that was a really bad idea. We cannot inject particles in somebody's arteries. It's gonna kill them. But we didn't give up. We said, people do CT scan and MRI all the time to visualize the flow inside our body. And that's gonna be a passive scaler. They, the doctor or the radiologist injects dye in our arteries to visualize what is happening in our body. And the dye is gonna get advected by the flow and it's gonna convect, it's gonna diffuse. It's gonna have a particular diffusion constant, let's call that Peclet number, when you non-dimensionalize your equations. But then if this is your data, can you actually back calculate the velocity and the pressure. And we wanted to have a framework that is independent, on the, independent of the geometry, independent of the initial condition and independent of the boundary conditions. It is independent of the Peclet number, the properties of a dye getting injected. It could be less than the Reynolds number or bigger than the Reynolds number. Reynolds number was 100 for this simulation. The algorithm worked, it was nice. We are not enforcing any boundary conditions. So it is boundary condition agnostic and the geometry could be as complicated as you want. And we are gonna see an example. So you have a passive scalar, you have this neural network and if you want to train this neural network, you need to have data on all of the outputs, C, U, V, W, and P. But here, we only have data on C, the concentration of the dye. To compensate for the lack of data on U, V, W, and P, we introduce some equations. Some of them are Navier-Stokes, and this one is just a passive scalar. It's getting advected by the flow and then it's diffusing. That's your data. The data is gonna play the role of the boundary condition. It's gonna play the role of the geometry. It's gonna play the role of your initial condition. And apparently that data is enough to give you the flow pattern inside the aneurysm. So one thing to note, why did we want it to be geometry independent and boundary condition independent? Because this aneurysm is just a small part of the entire arterial system of a human being. 
So the question is, what is the boundary condition here then? You are cutting that portion from the entire arterial system. What are proper boundary conditions? So it's not easy to model them. There are some ad hoc methods of doing it, but apparently you don't need that. This data is enough to give you the velocity and the information that you need. And, it, and in the paper, we are actually reporting the shear stress on the wall of the aneurysm. You can do fluid structure interaction. It's exactly the same framework. You can compute lift over drag, lift and drag forces, and you can compute the damping and the stiffness coefficients of your, the dynamics of your solid. You can do Eulerian and Lagrangian frameworks. This is your data, and from that data, you can couple Navier-Stokes, which are PDEs, with some ODEs to give you your velocity and the pressure. You can do turbulence. Apparently for turbulence, a good way of thinking about it is perhaps to look at the probability distribution of the solutions. Because if a system is chaotic, it doesn't make that much sense to look at the trajectories because the next time you're gonna simulate it because of numerical reasons, you're gonna pick out another solution anyways. So perhaps a better way of looking at it is look at the probability distribution. There is this uh, nice paper by the last author here, Payman Givi, that they take this probability distribution and from that they back calculate D. So knowing P, they are back calculating D. And it's 50 pages long of a paper of rigorous mathematics to give you D. In the eye of this algorithm, what you have is very similar to before. You have data on P and you want to learn D and you don't have any data on it, but you know your equation. And D is actually a function. So it's, a, it's appearing as a multiplicative term being multiplied by P and then you are taking the derivative. So you have an equation for P and you can compute D. So we covered forward problems, inverse problems. I have two more slides for model discovery problem. And let's start easy. Let's start with ordinary differential equations for finite dimensions. And then we go to infinite dimensions in the next slide. We want to learn F. And whenever you see a function, you can say I can approximate it with a neural network. So let's go ahead and approximate F by neural network. This is where you're gonna put your neural network. The question is, what is your last function? The last function, we are getting it out of uh, the trapezoidal rule. It is stable, it is second order, it's nice. So we're gonna use that. So you have your neural network here and here. And that's gonna give you a last function. Basically this term minus the other term has to be zero. So it's gonna give you a last function. This is your data. Your data could be from the Lorentz system. Again, if you have a chaotic system, there is no hope for you to get the trajectories correct, but you can actually hope for getting the big picture correct, like the attractors. And the model is doing that. We can do half bifurcation. We can do glycolytic oscillator, typical of biological systems. We can do SIR type models, for instance, for COVID. And uh, we can do Navier-Stokes in a lower dimensional space. And if you go to higher dimensions, like infinite dimensions, the space of functions, if you look at this formula, it is very generic. It's a time dependent system of partial differential equations. It's a system because you could be a vector and X could also be a vector. So X could be high dimensional, U could be high dimensional. And if you look at this equation, you see 
two places that you can put neural networks. One is a neural network that is taking time and X as an input and it's outputting U, like what we have been doing so far. UX, you can just do automatic differentiation. UXX, you can do automatic differentiation. So I don't worry too much about those two terms or any other terms that you want to include in your equation. This other M is very similar to the F function from the previous slide. You can approximate it with yet another neural network. So you can put two neural networks, one on U, one on F, one on M. The rest of it is the framework that we just considered. You create your residual neural network. This is physics in form, but you don't know your physics. Your physics is unknown. And then you can do mean squared error to give you a loss function, and then you minimize with respect to the parameters of U and F. You can collect data from time zero to 6.7. Your data could be scattered in space and time. You go ahead and train these two neural networks. Now you have two systems. One is your Berger's equation, which you know your equation. And the other one is the one that you just found. It's a neural network equation. The question is, how do you test whether you learn anything? One idea is to give these two systems the same initial and boundary conditions. So the initial condition here is a sign function and the boundary conditions are zero, Dirichlet, and solve both of them. If you learn something useful in your N, it should give you the same solution. And this is actually doing that in the regime where you had data and in the regime where you didn't have any data. So now your method is extrapolating. We know that machine learning is not good at extrapolating. It's good at interpolation, but not extrapolation, but here you're extrapolating. A harder test is give these two systems a different initial condition than the one that they were, they were trained on. So this is just testing. There is no training going on here. You have two systems. You give them two initial conditions, the same initial conditions, and you solve both of them. And they're giving you the same result. So you actually learn something in your neural network. It's a black box. This paper here is very interesting. It's a very honest paper. It tells you what are the drawbacks, what are the shortcomings, what are the advantages, where these sorts of frameworks are gonna be useful, et cetera. But it's really cool that uh, you can actually change your initial condition. This is a sine function as your initial condition. This is an exponential function. And you don't do any training at all here. It's just, uh, you can call it testing. And you can do it for different types of equations like KDV, koromata Wachinsky equation, and navier stokes I think I'm gonna stop here, but before I stop, for many of the topics that I mentioned here today. I don't have any proofs. There are some of my colleagues that are working on the theory of physics informed neural networks or Gaussian processes. So you can uh, take a look at their work. What I can offer is this GitHub repository where you can just clone the code for any of these topics. And you should be able to reproduce their results without much trouble. I think I'm gonna stop here and thank you for your attention. Thanks Mazia for a very interesting and nice talk. And I open the floor for questions. I guess some of the people might hurry to leave and join the other meeting. But if you have any question, please raise your hand or turn on your microphone and ask question. I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead, thanks. Hi. Could you, um, Hi. I, I was just trying to better understand the extent to which you were capturing implicit time stepping. So I don't know, it's probably your th third last slide. You had the, the Lorentz equation there. 
but for the three variable Lorentz model, and you'd written down an equation which was basically, you know, it looked like you'd, you'd sort of set it up for implicit time stepping. It, yeah, that equation in the top left there, you can see that x of n plus one occurs on both the right hand side and the left hand side. Um, and um, you know, if we were if we were solving that in a typical numerical way, oh, I guess for the three variable Lorentz model, it's so small it doesn't matter. But if, there, if it was like that on, say, some big three dimensional grid, we'd be doing it implicitly to actually to time step it. We'd we'd have to solve a um, you know, we'd have to minimize a, a cost function. Um, and I, I was just wondering if, is that, are you using that sort of implicit time stepping in this? I mean, there was, where, where is that implicit? Can, can you just talk, I'm just interested in like, uh, how you're dealing with that, those implicit aspects. So yes, uh, what's happening here is uh, you are going the inverse route. So, we are, we are trying to find f. f is a neural network, it's a function that is parameterized. And then you have your data. Your data is in the form of this time series. So this is actually better if you look at this figure here. This is your time. And then for each instance of your time, you have S1, S2, S3, so that's a time series. Right. So it's one time step up to the other kind of thing, is it? Yes, yes, right. and you have data, and you have data, I don't know, from time zero to time 7.5. Right, so. And right. the but, way that you're gonna right. treat, right. and now you need, you know your, what is your data, you know what, where your neural network is, your neural network is here. Now the question is, what is your loss function that you want to minimize? To come up with a loss function, you can discretize this equation. You can say, I'm going to look at this time step, for instance, this data point, the next data point. I'm going to take them, push them through my neural network, and then that's going to give me some values. And then uh, you're going to use this equation to write down your last function, basically xn plus 1 minus xn minus delta t over 2 this term in the parentheses, everything squared, is gonna give you a loss function for this pair of data points, but then you do a summation over your entire trajectory. Yeah. And that's gonna give you mean squared error. And then you are optimizing that mean squared error with respect to the parameters of F. And if you are interested in why implicit, because uh, it was giving us better approximations for our neural network. So it was actually showing up in the inverse problem as well. I, I guess I was just wondering because when you actually come to minimize that cost function, I'm not sure how you do it, but if you were to do, what do you sort of like a Gauss-Newton approach where you'd linearize about a guess field, no, it's actually very... a, a matrix on on x plus, times x n plus one and a matrix times x n, and then you have this trivial solution where if you just set m and n to zero, it's satisfied. But that's not the solution you want. No, these sort of trivial solutions. There, I'm wondering, like, how you afford, uh, avoid the trivial solutions that would minimize the cost function. Uh, that's a very good point. Actually, yeah. that's not gonna. Sh that's actually a very good point. It's not showing up for that particular example for this inverse problem here, this model discovery problem. It's not gonna show up because otherwise it's not gonna match. There is gonna be some discrepancy because of this delta t. If right. you set f to be zero. Then you have xn plus one minus xn squared. It's not yeah. going to be zero. Okay. It's not going to show up here, but you have a very fair point that you're making. Zero is a solution for Navier Stokes. Yeah. Well, I'm also just thinking, I'm not sure how you do the actual minimization, but I don't know. I'm from a mythological background, and so there, you know, we'll 
we'll sort of have this gas field and we'll linearize the equations about the gas field. And you end up with a matrix equation where you've got a matrix times Xn plus one equal a matrix times Xn. And then that, that's, yeah, that you're kind of talking about, I've got to find M and N. Yeah. And, so the way that- Don't worry, th thank you, that's enough. It's a, I don't want to take up too much time. <laughs> actually, as soon as you have a loss function, you are going to do gradient descent. You're going to do great. You do gradient descent, right? Yes. It's very similar to how you would train any other neural network. You just write down a loss function. In this case, it's mean squared error. And then you are minimizing a loss function with respect to the parameters of the neural network. Yeah, but you do it in sequences where you make a guess of the parameters and then you linearize around those parameters. And then you make no, you don't need to. You do it like conjugate gradient. Sorry, you do it. No, like you don't. You don't need to do. You don't need to do conjugate gradient. You just do a stochastic. Uh, yes, conjugate gradient is much more efficient, but you don't do it for neural networks. It's okay. Much simpler. You just do a stochastic gradient descent. Okay. You just take the gradient with respect to W and B, and then you descend in that direction until you hopefully minimize that loss function. Okay. So yeah, we are not contributing there. There is no contribution happening in how the training is done. It's basic uh, way of training neural networks. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so interesting. Thank you so much for your talk. I, I, no, thank you so much. I'm from a different field. I actually do data assimilation, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just super interested to see all this. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, thank you. Any more questions? I just might ask a quick question. In your Navier Strokes informed simulation and learning process, if you're adding more noise, that means if you're going through more turbulence, how is the deep learning going to react to that noise level? That's also a very good point. The harder the underlying function is, for instance, if you're if it's a sample from a turbulent system, you're gonna have a lot of oscillations yeah. in your solution. The deeper is gonna be the neural network, the more, the wider you're gonna need to make it, and therefore you have a lot of parameters, and then you're gonna need more powerful GPUs. And, uh, but you're absolutely right, it really matters. The framework should work in principle, but we haven't yet tested it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>